the former president. He is once again raising the specter of violence and inciting his followers, and he didn't even lose an election this time. No, this time, he was up at 1 a.m. last night attacking a local prosecutor, calling him a degenerate, and figuratively unleashing the dogs of war on the entire country. What does that suggest about how he sees his situation and the larger legal storm he's facing? Some clues to be found in what he posted at 1 this morning on his social network about Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg and potential charges in the Stormy Daniels hush money investigation. He asks how it can happen when, quote, it is known by all that no crime has been committed and also known the potential death and destruction and such a false charge could be catastrophic for our country. Why and who would do such a thing? His conclusion, only a degenerate psychopath that truly hates the USA. Now, this comes a day after he called Bragg an animal and posted this photo of himself getting ready to swing a baseball bat next to a photo of Bragg. And just today, Bragg's office received a package containing white powder and a threatening note. Now, the powder, thankfully, proved to be harmless, certainly less toxic than some on both sides of the aisle say the rhetoric is. The well, twice impeached former president's rhetoric uh, is reckless, reprehensible, and irresponsible. It's dangerous, and if he keeps it up, he's going to get someone killed. Now, that's House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. His Republican counterpart, Steve Scalise, said there is no place in America for political violence of any kind. But he also echoed the former president, accusing Bragg of carrying out, in his words, a political vendetta. And Jim Jordan, who chairs the House Judiciary Committee, dodged the question entirely when shown the post by a correspondent for NBC. Chairman Jordan told him in the correspondent's words, he can't read well without his glasses. Well, the former president apparently can, though, especially, it seems, the tea leaves, because the Manhattan case is only one of many, and they all seem to be coming to a head, especially this week, the federal documents investigation with his defense attorney, Evan Corcoran, back before a federal grand jury today without attorney-client privilege to shield him from potentially damaging questions. There's that, and now a ruling that all of these former close aides cannot use executive privilege to avoid testimony before the January 6th grand jury. Put it all together, and there's plenty to keep anyone up at night. And tomorrow, the former president has a campaign rally in Waco, Texas. As we approach the 30th anniversary of this, the FBI raid on the Branch Davidian compound, a time and place and incident that has become a touchstone for violent anti-government groups and individuals. And though the Trump campaign says it is a coincidence, the Houston Chronicle today called the choice of location not just a dog whistle, but a, quote, blaring air horn of a Mac 18 wheeler, end quote, to extremists. Joining us now, someone who saw a Trump-incited mob up close on January 6th, former Republican congressman and senior political commentator for CNN, Adam Kinzinger, also CNN senior law enforcement analyst and former deputy FBI director Andrew McCabe and CNN chief correspondent Caitlin Collins. Caitlin, let me start with you. How are the former president's uh, death and destruction comments being viewed inside the Trump camp? Because just days ago, his allies and advisors were privately urging him to tone down the rhetoric. Yeah, they obviously didn't even want him to call for protest, really, in this situation. You saw people like Speaker Kevin McCarthy later saying that Trump wasn't calling for <clears> protest, <throat> even though he very explicitly did so on his own website, Truth Social. And so this is definitely an escalation, saying that there could potentially be death or destruction if he is indicted, as we know is pretty widely expected at this point, even though it's the timing of that that's unclear. And so this is certainly a cause for concern. I mean, it's been over a week now that I've been hearing from his allies who were saying they did not want to see anything that anywhere close resembled a January 6th playing out on the streets of Manhattan because it was a major concern of theirs given how damaging it's been uh, for the former president. And so this just shows, though, I think that also his post, you know, almost a week ago now when he said he was going to be arrested on Tuesday, which obviously was not borne out and there was no indication that that was actually ever anything that was conveyed to his campaign or to his uh, to his world. That just shows that he is he is allowing it to build. He is calling for protest. He's even kind of mocking Republicans who are saying that protest should be peaceful. He's saying they're trying to destroy our country and people are calling for these you know, peaceful protests in the wake of that. So, Andrew, how much does this inflammatory rhetoric heighten the tension and security concerns of what may be a possible indictment next week? 
Well, it should absolutely have heightened the security concerns of professionals who are involved in protecting not just New York City, but also Washington, D.C., and any place else around this country where extremist supporters of the former president might gather. I mean, look, what, what we're seeing here is, uh, is predictable, and um, it shouldn't surprise anyone. He is a one-note orchestra. He Donald Trump appeals to the lowest common denominator, the most baser, violent instincts of his most extreme supporters. He's, he did it on January 6th. He summoned that mob to D.C. to try to you know, obstruct the, the peaceful transfer of power, and he's doing it now to try to get himself out of trouble. And to be clear, he is in a lot of trouble. We all watched this morning while his attorney in the documents investigation entered the grand jury to testify against him. I mean, that is an unprecedented thing that we're seeing. Um, and Evan Corcoran is in a position to provide unbelievably damaging testimony against him. Presumably that happened today. And now eight of his, of his uh, closest advisors have been told they cannot rely on executive privilege and they must appear as well. So it's a very, very bad week for Trump and predictably, he goes low and is is uh, resorting to the one thing that he does better than anyone, and that's appealing to people's violent tendencies. You know, Congressman Kinzinger, knowing everything you know about the lead up to January 6th, you were on the January 6th committee. How concerning are these comments to you? And what does it say that that you know Chairman Jim Jordan and Speaker McCarthy aren't even addressing it? So I'm concerned, not necessarily about what happens in the next week or two weeks. It's all this stuff radicalizes people over time. And people may continue to grow more thinking about violence and eventually going to violence. And it takes a spark that so far we still think, you know, oh, Trump, he'll, he'd never say like, hey, come and use violence on my behalf. But he easily could. And he's putting in people's minds to use violence. I, I got to tell you, John, the thing that bothers me the most we could talk about this whole, it's the silence, the silence of my colleagues, my former colleagues. You know, every Republican who holds elected office has got to speak up. I don't even care if, you, you know, you don't have to do it on national TV. Put out a statement that says there is, the whole purpose, by the way, of politics is to prevent violence. That's why politics was created. The utter silence is so weak by my party that I just, I, to me, that's what I can't believe even more than what Donald Trump puts out on Truth Social.